we don't have a way of engaging what we can't see, what we can't name, what we can't experience, what we can't think. That's been the problem of the unrepresentable forever. So we're here to talk about OM. Uh, OM. OM is a word that is actually not a word. It's a representation of a sound which people take to be a word. And it's actually not a sound either. It's a complex of sounds. And it may be all sound. It's meant to be the representation of primordial reality, because that's how people, most people represent themselves as uh, meaning something by it. But in fact, it's not anything that we think it is. What we think about it and how we represent its history is a product of our point of view, whatever that may be. All human beings have a point of view. Some people pretend to not have a point of view when they say that OM is primordial reality because they're interested in having a single principle that represents everything. Problem with that is that's what we call religion. And OM is not religion. Religions are based on phenomena that we experience like OM, um, that is things that seem to embody everything whatsoever, that are the basis of all things as OM is supposed to be. But the first thing you have to say about OM is that it's not OM, it's AUM. And AUM is a range of sounds, actually. It's a, ah, u, mm. And <clears throat> that range is pretty much the range of sound. It goes from a, ah, u, mm, all the way down to the body. So it's like the process of incarnation. It's like going from absolute zero reality, which we can't represent, all the way to just where we are right at that moment. Mm. Comes down into the, into the body. So one of the advantages of using OM as a practice um, vehicle is that it allows us to experience that, um, at least at the level of wherever we are at that moment. But there's a problem with thinking that OM is going to do it for us, because first of all, nothing will. We have to do it for ourselves. And second of all, it's not a thing. It's not a solution to anything. It's a principle. Principles are very hard to represent. We give them names like gravity is the principle of things being attracted to bigger bodies or falling to the earth. But nobody quite knows what it really, really is. And it hasn't had a firm uh, representation in the thing that we call uh, proof in, in science. It's, it's, it's still a principle. It's a principle that we look at. Ohm is like that. It's something that everybody has been talking about is probably the one if you look at it as a word, om, um, it's probably the one thing that's recognized by everybody everywhere, just about. In any, certainly in any literate culture, anybody who hears that will have some idea about what it is, and usually they'll have a very abstract idea because it's a very abstract principle. But when you actually say it, it becomes extremely particular, extremely now. Um, how did I say that? What did I do? What, what part of my mouth did I use? I used my front of my mouth, which I had to open. I had to relax my jaw to say, ah. I can't hold it tight and say, ah, properly. Ah, ooh, mm. I had to close my mouth. Ah, ooh. I had to go, ooh, and then I had to go, mm, in order to say this. So I had to do pretty much the full range of things that my mouth can do while I'm speaking. So it, it's a kind of total situation, a situation that contains all of the things that I do when I speak practically, or at least the range of them. So Aum is that event, that action. And it's only what it is in the way that I actually say it. The abstraction, what it is, the more I get abstract about it and start to think about Aum, I'm thinking about God, or I'm thinking about the whole universe. And if that's what you like doing, then Aum is for you. But Aum is not that. Om is just the opportunity to think whatever we think in its presence. It, it's interpreted very differently by different religions. 
Hindus uh, like to think of it as the embodiment of gods, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, you know. And, and so it's a trilogy, Aum, Aum is a trilogy. And most religions have trinities of one kind or another, or they think in terms of trinities. It's a very popular way for religions to think because it, it's convenient, you know. So Om contains all of these possibilities that we think about in different religions. Actually, in Tibetan religion, or Tibetan Buddhism, uh, particularly Dzogchen, uh, Om is not the fundamental principle. Um, just the first sound is ah, ah, mm, on the principle that you can hardly say anything and not say an ah. Ah is fundamental. Ah is taken to be the fundamental reality. Again, this is a way of experiencing what we are and what we think and, and what we can know. Lots of practitioners of saying om uh, promise you a lot. They promise that you'll reach God or you'll reach your own embodiment of God. Um, and I can't say that you don't. You know, I don't say anything, actually. I don't have an opinion about that. I don't have an opinion about Om. Um, I've used it. I use it um, as an experience of fundamental reality because it actually does function that way. But I avoid thinking that it's any particular thing because, in fact, even the sound of Aum if you manifest it in your body and you say the sound, you chant the sound, runs the risk of blocking what Aum actually is. Because Aum is not a sound. Aum is what we phenomenologically engage it through. We don't have a way of engaging what we can't see, what we can't name, what we can't experience, what we can't think. That's been the problem of the unrepresentable forever. Uh, that's why Buddhism doesn't like to posit, one of the reasons why Buddhism doesn't like to posit the existence of gods or God as such, because it can't be represented. And so the very act of thinking it, of representing it, of interpreting it, potentially blocks our access to whatever it is that compels us to want there to be God or ultimate reality of what that is, which we take to be a fundamental aspect of our being, longing for this return to what we are. So it's probably healthier to think of Aum as a primordial condition of ourselves, of whatever it is that we are. Now, from a non-dual perspective, we're non-separate from whatever that is, whether you think of it as God or ultimate reality or emptiness, shunyata in the, in the Buddhist um, sense of it. We can only know what that means through direct experience. Experience is the basis of everything. It's what differs, what makes meditation or yoga or tai chi or any of these practices differ from organized religion as such. Instead of believing in something, we take the presentation of the elements that make up that system as opportunities to engage with reality at a different level from our habitual life from the patterns that we've inhabited, we've inherited from culture, from parents, from biological experience, from difficulties, all those things that make up our way of responding to the world, which in their extreme form are neuroses. In their less extreme forms, they're just cultural patterns. Whatever they are, they are not the ultimate reality as such unless you arrive at a non-dual view. Now, a non-dual view looks at Om and every other sound as inseparable. And so, Aum exists inside the words that I'm speaking. So if you already are enlightened, in the, whatever that means, um, but assuming that it does mean something, if you are enlightened, then you can hear in everything said, in every moment, every speaking, every gesture of your energy, the reality that Om represents. So there's no impulse to separate Aum from all other sounds once you're hearing it in everything.
at that moment, all of reality becomes the teacher, becomes teaching. And you realize that all sounds have a home within them. And John Cage built an entire practice of, well, based on Zen originally, um, and the I Ching. He built an entire practice on the notion that all sounds are equally beautiful. And what he meant by beautiful is they're equally real, they're equally inspiring, they're equally opportunities for us to engage with things in their true reality. Isn't that what we're after anyway, is to represent, not, is to experience ourselves and reality as a single profound reality, which we are non-separate from. But we live in a relative condition. We get tired, we need to eat, we get upset, we have emotional patterns. And all these things are the opposite of that wish for a single primordial reality which we're in touch with all the time. And this is the basis of the problem, of one of the major problems of emphasizing Aum as the primordial reality, which is that we're lamenting that we're not it. If I say, oh, I have to get back to my Aum, that means I'm not already that. And I'm kind of emphasizing the fact, I'm kind of projecting the fact that I am not Aum, I have to get back to Aum. Well, that could be useful if it makes us practice, it makes us more contemplative, it makes us experience some degree of silence. In that, in that sense, it's useful, unless we do the conceptual thing of thinking that we're getting back to God just by the fact that we're embracing Aum, in which case we're deceiving ourselves. We're putting the symbol in the place of the reality and thinking that we're more holy and these other things are less holy because they're not thinking about Om, but I am thinking about Om. So I'm saying Om, so I'm more holy than other people, which is nonsense from a non-dual perspective. That's my one prejudice, it seems, I keep coming back to that. My one prejudice is that it's more interesting to look at things in a non-dual way than it is to look at them in a dualistic way. Because when you oppose things, if I say, this moment of reality is not Aum, what have I just done? I've just trashed reality as I ordinarily live it, and I make myself kind of uh, wrong, kind of not so good, um, deficient. And that misses the entire point of non-dual practice. Yoga is intrinsically a non-dual practice. It doesn't depend upon any um, theology or any system of belief. People use systems of belief, they use theology, they, tell us what yoga means, that's fine. That's just what they're doing. But really, there are infinite yogas. You may practice one kind of yoga or prefer that kind of yoga, nothing wrong with that. You have to practice one thing, whatever it is you're doing. But that one thing doesn't have to be represented by a system of belief or rules, or it may have some strong suggestions that you do things in a certain way because they're effective. It's a practical rule of thumb sort of thing but it's not inscribed in reality by a higher power. That doesn't mean that higher powers aren't involved in, in particular practices of yoga. They may very well be, but it's not one system that is right above all other systems. Otherwise, somebody up there made a big mistake and made a whole bunch of religions that were wrong, except the one that you happen to be in. And that doesn't say a lot for his or her judgment.